Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is psychology and UX. It's a very broad talk, going through different aspects of psychology, giving you some interesting examples of what they say about UX in terms of the agenda for it, in terms of examples, in terms of puzzles we still need to solve. These are some of the examples of the areas of psychology we're going to look at. But let's start with social psychology. Social psychology tells us about how society is changing and what the agenda is in terms of products and services and what's needed. One of the big problems we're facing at the moment, if you think it's a problem, is the ageing of the population. And I suppose it is a problem in some ways. And one of the consequences of that is dementia. This is a product, or sorry, a project that's going on at the moment in the NHS where dogs are being used to help people with dementia. It relies to some extent on behavioural psychology. So what happens is, if you have dementia and you need to take medicine, for example, you can have a dog that's trained to get your medicine. So your medicine will be in a bite-proof packet, a little beep will go off, the dog will go and fetch the medicine, bring it to you, you open it and take the medicine. It's a low-tech solution to a modern problem. And one of the advantages is that not only do people get the medicine they need, but the companionship with a dog is valuable too. You've probably seen this many times before. For anybody who hasn't seen it, what it is is a poster that operates as a shop. You can buy things from it just by using your smartphone to choose the goods you want. And this happens in South Korea. Now, this was done by Tesco, who operate under a different name in South Korea. They've now become the number two retailer in the country. But what they've understood, and the point I want to make with this, is that this kind of thing is ideal for the social conditions in that country. The hours people work there are very, very long. One of my clients is Samsung, They're, and I work with them quite regularly. I can remember the first time I worked with them, I know they're eight hours ahead of us because of the time difference. I thought, OK, well, I'll send an email at 4 o'clock in the afternoon UK time. That's midnight for them. I can relax. You know, I definitely won't hear anything till tomorrow morning. <coughs> Five minutes later, back comes the reply. I thought, OK, I'll push it out till 5 o'clock. 1 o'clock for them. Next day, same thing happens. It's a very, very hard-working society with very little free time compared with Western societies. And this works very well there. Doesn't necessarily mean it will transfer here, but there it's ideal for the social conditions. A challenge that faces us in the UX community at the moment is changing work patterns. Nomadic working, home working, a combination of those things. And particularly for any of us involved with standards, the digital screen equipment standards are very much out of date in this respect. They're all to do with PC at your workplace. And I'm currently involved in a project that's working to change those. But we need to understand the social context of the workplace and how people do change the way they work. So that's an example of how social psychology can affect things. Let's have a look at group psychology. Has anybody come across this book before, Blind Spot? No. Well, Blind Spot is about a computer program that's generated, I think it's at Stanford University, that can calculate how racist you are. <laughs> and most liberal minded people don't think of themselves as at all racist, but if you have a go at this program, you might be in for a shock. Essentially, how it works is it puts a, a face on the screen, either a, a white face, a black face, or an Asian face. And it puts a word under that face. So it could be a word like honest, or dishonest, or criminal. And you have to say whether the word is good or bad. And the more quickly you get that right, it says something about your impression of race. 
So if, for example, you very quickly associate goods words with Asian faces, that would mean you had a positive view of Asian people. It works on the same principle. You imagine if you have the word red written in red, and they say, what was that word? You say red straight away. If you write the word red in green letters and ask what it says, it takes longer. So the incongruence in your mind is related to the pause. In this country, there's an organization trying to fight racism through UX called Jewify.org. Has anybody come across Jewify.org? It's a Jewish organization very much in favor of equality and against racism. And what they do is that if you go onto their site, which sadly has been hacked recently, so probably not a good idea to visit right now, if you go onto their site, they put through the content of the daily newspapers and they replace any ethnic word with the word Jew. So this would say Jews ruining British quality of life. And it's helped within the Jewish community to activate people against racism. The Jewish, Jewish Chronicle has supported this very strongly. But again, how can we show people? It's empathy again, as we saw in the last talk. If you can empathize with other people's plight, you can call them to action. I spent a lot of time working for the government over the last 10 years, and we were doing some work with YouGov, looking at wikis. And why wikis work and some, why they don't sometimes work. It seems that wikis only tend to work well under two conditions. When the people contributing to them believe that the readers are knowledgeable, and when the people contributing to them believe, sorry, when they don't have any idea what the views and biases of the readership are. Under those conditions, they tend to work well. If you believe that the readership has a particular bias, people just play to that bias in a very cheap and unthought out way very often, and the wiki provides very little information of value. So you need to get those two conditions in place for it to work. I said YouGov, I meant DirectGov we work with, and we had terrible problems with the wikis we set up because they just came, you just got streams of opinionated abuse all the time because that wasn't in place. So let's have a quick look at gender psychology. Has anybody come across Men in Sheds? Some of you, yeah. Well, Men in Sheds is about men being lonely. There's a great epidemic of loneliness at the moment. More and more people living on their own. And men generally, according to this research, tend to be less easy at socializing than women. And also, if you want to bring men together, it tends to be easier to bring them together around a task, rather than just saying, let's have a men's coffee morning. <laughs> and so men in sheds works by, you can, go, you can type into your local shed, and you go there and you do things like make bicycles or whatever, which you then sell on, and it makes money for the shed, and it goes round in circles. But the point is, you meet other men by doing stuff together. And sometimes the way of bringing people together can be different, depending on gender. Developmental psychology. Now, again, in some of our government work, we've been looking at using avatars in online interactions. So instead of talking to somebody on the phone, you talk to an avatar. And we did some research about what avatars would work best for different people. And so we assumed, OK, well, if you're a young woman, you probably prefer a young female avatar. If you're a young man, a young male, an old, older man, an older male, those kind of things. But actually, it didn't quite work out that way. So when we looked at young men and the avatars they trusted most, can anybody guess what kind of avatars young men trust most? What was that? Not necessarily. Any other? It was actually young women. 
Okay, who do young women trust most? Young women. Yeah, young women, true. <laughs> who do old women trust most? No, young women again. Everybody trusts young women most. <laughs> and this was a bit of a surprise. If any of you have used Ask Lisa on the National Rail website, you probably remember she used to be a lot older than this before this research was done. <laughs> And nobody quite knows. We don't really have a full explanation. We think it's a developmental psychology thing, that we, when we're young, when we're children, our mothers are young women. So it may come from the fact we trust our mothers because they're young women, and therefore we trust young women most. Another example, developmentally, this is about young women, but from a different point of view this time. This is an example from the US Air Force, which has now been subsequently been adapted by our Air Force here, about how you get the attention of a pilot in a severely stressful situation, or when there's an awful lot of information to process. So their idea, the US Air Force, was to say, OK, you're flying the plane, you've got all these dials giving you information, you've got all these sounds going off here and there. How do you distinguish the information that's important from the information that's absolutely life and death important. How are we going to make sure that these pilots prioritize that information? And what they said is, well, okay, these pilots are all young men. That's changed now, but at the time it was true. What is it the young men are most responsive to? Attractive young women. Yeah, <laughs> young women again. So they said, what we're going to do is we're going to have a young woman's voice come on when there's a real emergency. <laughs> so let's say you're going too slow. This young woman's voice will come on and say, speed, speed, speed. And then you look at your speed and do something about it. And it's proved very successful. It's called bitching Betty, because she only comes on when she complains about something. <laughs> <laughs> they actually have a Hollywood actress voice this, and it's proved uh, very successful. And as I said, we've taken it on here. So again, just thinking about what people respond to can be very important. OK, we talked a bit about colour earlier. This is a wrestling match from the 2012 Olympics here in London. I don't know anything at all about Olympic wrestling, but I can make an educated guess as to who's going to win that match. How can I do that? Colour of the shirt. Hmm? Colour of the shirt. Yeah, the colour of the shirts. 78% of wrestling matches at the London Olympics were worn by the person wearing red. So it has a massive effect. It's probably the bigger effect than anything else to do with the sport. In judo, by contrast, where one person wears white and the other wears blue, it was exactly 50-50 winning ratio. And a lot of people think it's to do with the psychology of red. Imagine somebody comes towards you and they're red in the face. You think, oh my goodness, he's a bit intimidating. He's very angry with me. If somebody comes to you and they're completely blue, you think, oh, they look a bit frightened. So there's something about this that is causing an effect and, in a way, ruining the integrity of the sport, you could argue. Because in wrestling, it's not like other Olympic sports where you wear the colours of your country. You either wear red or blue, and you just have a flip of a coin to decide who's going to wear what. Now, colour psychology can be important anywhere. For example, blue, although it may not be a great colour for sport, is a colour that people trust. And there's research done recently in Korea, but I think it's probably fairly internationally generalizable, that says if you have a blue website on a bank site, people trust that bank more or that financial institution more. So thinking about color psychology is a vital part of content. Eudaimonic psychology. Eudaimonic is a kind of fancy way of talking about people's values. Who here has come across Good Gym before? Some of you have. It's in London, and it's, going, it's getting a bit wider. Good Gym adds moral value to exercising. That's kind of their, their advertising point. So let's tell you how Good Gym works. If you, for example, live in... Let's imagine you live near Hyde Park or something. So you type in... You go to the Good Gym website and type in your postcode. And you say, OK, I want to have... 30-minute run, followed by 20 minutes of weights. 
And it will come back and say, okay, run around to Mrs. Smith's house and dig her garden for 20 minutes. <laughs> because then you're getting the aerobic exercise of the run and then the anaerobic of the digging. And it adds a meaning to something that would otherwise be found as meaningless. And it's a very, very important issue to people that they have to have meaning in what they do. It raises people up. This is a convent in Newcastle. Some work, this is some work done by Northumbria University. And again, it's understanding the values of your user, empathizing with them. Now, this group of nuns have very strict rules. They're not allowed to watch television. They're not allowed to go outside of the grounds of the convent. And they must spend all day praying, or most of the day praying. The problem they have is that they don't know what to pray about because they can't watch TV, and they don't know what's in the news. So what they, Northumbria University have done is they, they, they send in a live feed in this wooden cross of topics to pray about. <laughs> so this is something to do with something going on in Montenegro here, and they, pray, they use that as their prayer. So it's a very traditional issue, a very traditional thing, like praying and being a nun, infused with a very modern thing of new technology to solve a problem that comes from understanding those people's differences or those people's constraints. This is the Honda Insight. And one of the nice things here, again, it's about reinforcing values. When you're driving this car, you can try and drive as economically as possible or as eco as possible, and you get rewarded. It's a little reward. These windmills increase depending on how eco you're driving. So it's gamifying driving to reinforce people's values. You feel good, you drive better, you do more of what you want to do, which is protect the environment. Okay, let's have a look at positive psychology. Now this is a big area, which is new in psychology really. It's about 15 years old, I would say. And it's a psychology of what makes certain people perform really, really brilliantly or have very happy lives or be very healthy. What makes people above average is what this is about. But it also looks at things like happiness. And one of the things it's introduced us to is something called the peak end rule. Does anybody know about the peak end rule? Some of you again. Well, the peak end rule is about when you reflect on things. So if you remember Donald Norman wrote about visceral behavioral reflective the way we process emotions. And afterwards, when we reflect on how happy we were, we don't tend in our mind to average out our happiness over the whole day. We tend to think of the peak of the day, the, the moment of the day that had its best or worst moment, and how the day ended. It's not that those are the only things we think about, but we regard they get processed more importantly than they should logically. So if you go to an amusement park, and you were to monitor your mood throughout the day at an amusement park, like Legoland, you'd probably find that the emotion you felt more than anything was boredom. <laughs> because you're in queues for ages. And the time you spend on the ride is very small compared with the amount of time you spend queuing. But the, the ride provides those high peaks, and you remember them really, really well. To get the end right... Legoland decided they will not close their gift shop until the last person has left. So at the end of your experience, you're not rushed out the door. But we can apply this to any user experience. Give them that big high and give a good end. This was some work done in Florida. A rehabilitation center for older people with musculoskeletal problems. What they did was to give them physiotherapy, but somebody came up with the idea of why don't we also psychologically prime them and see if it makes them better. Now, psychologically priming means lifting your expectations about what you can achieve. And so they did an experiment. They showed some of these older people videos of older people doing very active things, like playing golf, like jogging, like swimming, that kind of stuff. They showed some people videos of older people doing stereotype old things, 
like walking around in a very frail, doddery manner, and this kind of thing. And then they showed some people no videos at all. And they found those people who recovered most quickly or required less treatment were the ones who were shown these videos of the active older people. The ones who had the stereotypical ones or the ones who had no videos, that didn't seem to make much difference. But raising expectations as part of a process can be a very important part of the user experience. Some time ago, I was working with NHS Choices, and this is the website for the National Health Service in the UK. It has all sorts of information on it, but one of the things that we were concerned about is the stories you get in the newspapers about health issues. And the danger is it can lead to learn helplessness, because people say, oh, well, there's no point in me trying to be healthy because everything gives you cancer. I mean, this, there's a guy on the project, he, he made a list. This is a list of the things the Daily Mail say give you cancer. And he, he managed to pick this up in only six months. He had nanoparticles, obesity, sugary drinks, beer, bacon, ham, processed meats, salt, saturated fat, sugar, food generally, <laughs> not exercising, energy-saving light bulbs, being single, Facebook, <laughs> having a cold, wine, talcum powder, sun cream, having sex, not having sex, <laughs> sausages, burgers, feeling lonely, vitamin E, moisturizer, soup, hair dye, Pringles, hula hoops, <laughs> Prince Charles's organic crisps, X-rays, mobile phones, red meat, tooth whitener, chocolate flour, living in the south, <laughs> caffeine, being middle class, <laughs> green tea, the contraceptive pill, being tall, having rich parents, hormone replacement therapy, not doing enough housework, and garlic. <laughs> now the problem with that is, people are going to pick that up and say, well, there's no point in giving up smoking because I'm on Facebook. So what we try to do is to give people the, the real headlines behind the story. And this overcomes this concept called learned helplessness. It empowers people. <coughs> Risk psychology. Does anybody know what this is? This device is an in-car safety system. Adaptive yeah, adaptive cruise control. So what it is, is it means you, you can set your cruise control to a certain speed. And, but if the car in front of you is going slower than that speed, it will keep you that, so let's imagine I've set it for 70, but I'm on a congested motorway, so the car in front's only going 40, then it will slow me down to 40 until that car speeds up. But there's something called risk homeostasis. People compensate for risk, or they use their safety to do something else risky. I mean, I won't tell you who it was, but we were working with the head of one of these, the company who was using this. And I said to him, well, how's that, uh, how's that, uh, adaptive cruise control going. He said, oh, it's great. I said, well, why do you like it? And he said, well, it's brilliant. I just, uh, you know, get, tuck my car in behind the lorry and then I can text while I'm driving. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about keeping from the car in front. And that's called risk homeostasis. The fact is you use your, you don't use your extra safety to be safer. You use it to engage in another risky behavior. And so it seems from the UX point of view, it may be better to hide the benefit. So if we looked at cars, we looked at cruise control, we looked at ABS. Does everybody know what ABS is and how it works? Some of you do. It's basically automatic, special braking system that makes braking more effective. And there was something called electronic stability control, which nobody <coughs> usually understands how that works. But we found that of those three, by far the one with the biggest safety benefit was electronic stability control. And it was because people didn't understand it. They didn't understand it, so they couldn't compensate for it by doing something else. So sometimes it can be very important. This is an example which I owe to Giles Colburn, a presenter I saw at UX in London. He was talking about a phenomenon that happened in the Middle East, countries like Saudi Arabia, 
car accidents were constant, have been constant for days and days and days, or years and years and years, suddenly dipped for about three days and then went back up again. Does anybody know, it was about two years ago, three years ago this happened, why this happened? The BlackBerry network went down. Exactly, the BlackBerry network went down. And in those countries, driving whilst using those things is not illegal. So the question for us as UX practitioners is, do, what do we do about it? If our users are being put in danger, is there anything we can do about it? I'm just throwing it out there as a question. I don't know. I guess you could disable the motion, disable it when it's in motion, but then, of course, you're in motion in certain situations where it's perfectly safe to use. Cognitive psychology. I was doing some work with a domestic appliances company, and they wanted us to make ironing more pleasurable. <coughs> and after we did a lot of research, and actually decided we couldn't, because everybody hated it. <laughs> and so they said, okay, well, just make ironing fast in that case. Make it as fast as you can. <laughs> and so we worked with a some scientists, and they designed the fastest iron for big objects. And it, does anybody know that sport, curling? Where you have some people brushing the ice. Anyway, it looked like a curling ball sliced in half, basically, with a handle at this angle and a big semicircular base. And we gave this to people in trials. We gave them that iron, and we gave them four or five other irons, and, took, and timed them ironing big objects. And there was no doubt that this new iron that they designed was by far the fastest. But we didn't tell people their times. But we then asked people to say, well, which was the fastest then? And the iron that we had designed came right, right near the bottom. When we looked at the statistics, can anybody guess what it was that determined how fast people thought an iron was? The yeah, the shape. But well, what about the shape particularly? Yeah, how aerodynamic it was. <laughs> But, you know, unless you're ironing at 200 miles an hour, it's not, <laughs> it's not going to make very much difference. But the point is that people do have these metaphors in their head, and, it, and they transfer them across. One of the reasons I think Apple was so successful is because of the metaphor they used. I mean, I'm old enough to be of the generation where we had DOS computers when I first started using them. And they were a nightmare. Whatever you typed in, it said syntax error, and they crashed a lot of the time. And this came along, and suddenly it's different. It was, we talk about Office being a Microsoft thing, but actually the metaphor they used here was Office. Desktop, trash can, all that kind of thing. It took you out of the frightening world of computers into the friendly world of the Office. And that's an example, again, of how a metaphor can be powerful. How we process information is also very much part of cognitive psychology. Has anybody come across this before, the billion pounder gram? Yeah. It's a nice piece of design from the Guardian website. But the nice thing is it helps us to... Pro it's just such simple, easy ways of processing. And the idea behind it was if you watch the news and they say the government spent £10 billion on something, well, is that a lot? Is that not very much? I don't know. You know, you're blinded by the number. But this puts it nicely and simply into perspective. So help people to process information. Let's just do a, a thought experiment. You don't have to say anything out loud. Just imagine this. Imagine that you're walking on a deserted track, maybe in a wooded area. You see to your left a shallow pond. The pond is very dirty, but you know the pond only comes up to your knees in terms of its depth. In the pond, you see a child, and the child is face down and obviously drowning. You can save the child at no risk whatever to yourself, but to do so, you'll have to act quickly. You haven't got time to take off your shoes or your trousers, and they will be ruined because the pond is so muddy. And they will cost you £100 to replace. Would you save the life of the child? Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, <laughs> but I assume most of us would say yes to that. But if I say, can I have £100 to save the lives of three children in Africa? That's an incredibly hard sell. But in principle, it's exactly the same thing. But it comes back to what we were talking about in the previous presentation, the power of a story, 
the power of a narrative. Studies have been done to show that charities that tell you the story of somebody's life, a little boy or a little girl, do much better in terms of raising money than if they just give you statistics. Because the narrative gives us empathy again, coming back to what we said before. Kiva's a good website. Kiva, for those of you who don't know, it is a website where you make loans to businesses in the developing world. And the people go on there, and they, the people whose businesses it is, go on there and tell you their story. And you can make a loan directly to them. It's microfinance. And then you get your money back, and you can give it to somebody else. It's a kind of efficient form of helping businesses grow in the developing world. But again, it's the personalness of it that makes the difference. The fact that you can connect personally with the person who needs to borrow the money. And let's go on to the final one now. What's called black swan psychology. What psychologists refer to with a black swan is something which has a massive effect, but we didn't think about. We didn't see it as being part of the system we were looking at. In the case of a user experience, for example, I was doing some work with Transport for London. They spent a lot of money making London more accessible for mobility-challenged people. And yet, they're having trouble getting mobility-challenged people to use the buses. Can anybody guess what the number one reason that wheelchair users and other mobility challenged people don't like using buses in London is. Any ideas? Other people won't give them space on the bus. That was one of them. It wasn't number one, but it was up there, yeah. Any other ideas? It's going to be yes, it's related to that, but not exactly that. Yeah, kind of. I'll tell you what it was. They were, bus drivers were rude to them. <laughs> Nearly every person we spoke to had at least one experience of a bus driver being unfriendly or offhand. And when we went through, tried to find out why, it turns out Transport for London measured the performance of bus companies on one measure alone. Anybody know what that is? Are you on time? And of course, if you run late, putting a wheelchair on a bus takes time. The bus will start to run late. At the moment, there's no Oyster card reader where the wheelchair gets on, which is at the back. If there was, we could probably keep track of the number of disabled people getting on and make an allowance for it. The bus driver gets it in the neck from his or her boss if they're late. So you set up a system which unintentionally is causing huge problems for disabled people because of what you measure has those knock-on effects. And that's an example of needing to think things through. The human in the system is important. I did a study for the airline industry recently and they looked at all the things that made people happy or unhappy with their airline experience, from the check-in, from the quality of the seating, from whether it ran on time, all those things. The number one thing that affected how people perceived an airline was the behavior of the cabin crew. So it's the human component. And so often we need to think about, in the UX system, how do we design the human interactions through training or through scripts that people need or whatever it might be. But we can't expect just the technological side in complex systems to give the benefits on its own. A few years ago, we were looking at causes of unnecessary, preventable deaths in the health system. And there was this, uh, another one of these factors. When I look back on it, this thing had been looking, probably staring me in the face since I was eight years old. But it wasn't until we got research from America that we realized the problem. There's a killer in the health service, not just in Britain, in most Western countries, or has been, there was. It was killing more people per year than every form of cancer apart from lung cancer. It killed 14,000 people a year in the UK and 70,000 a year in America. Can anybody guess what it was? Big pardon? No. Hey, you got it. Somebody said it. it was doctor's handwriting. <laughs> doctor's handwriting was responsible for 14,000 deaths a year in the United Kingdom. Either from people mis either the pharmacist misread the prescription, the dosage was misread. In a hospital environment, maybe the nurse couldn't see what the doctor had written. So now in the UK, all prescriptions are written on computers. 
The World Health Organization has said that doctors, if they don't have access to a computer, must write in block capitals only. And thousands and thousands of lives have been saved just by this problem, an unexpected problem that we didn't expect. So that's a little whistle-stop tour through some psychology, a bit thrown together, I must admit. But the key thing is to understand the trends that are going on, understand the role of the human in the system, and create things that meet not only our practical needs, but also engage with us emotionally. Thanks very much. Thank you.